in our ninth season. Um, and even prior to that, I was working, as was mentioned, in, in the organic uh, gardening and organic farming field um, for a number of years. So um, I, I use a lot of what I'm going to talk today, today about. I use a lot of examples that other gardeners have given me. So I hope in the presentation today, people feel free to share what has worked for you. Um, I'm going to talk about... Um, ways of pest control that don't require too much purchasing of product, um, using often items that are in your kitchen. Um, and, you know, the, the philosophy of, of organic farming is really trying to prevent pests hey, from happening in the right. first place. So one of yeah. the ways to do that is by really good crop rotations. I hope folks know what, what that means so that you're not planting the same family in the same spot year after year. And the reason for that is that pests yeah. and diseases build That's up good. in the soil. So we're trying to prevent that. I'll start sharing my screen so that you don't have to look at my face for too, too long. And as was mentioned, please interrupt. Um, I think it's probably, it's better to have the questions when the slide or, or something sort of spurs you and you have a question rather than waiting to the end. Um, so happy to stop at any time and, um, and go on from there. So let's, let's get into it. Um, I'm gonna use examples of very common spring pests um, that I think most people have seen and, and come across and try and sort of provide a framework of how you can approach pest control through, first of all, managing rather than um, applying. So doing some changes in, the, in your gardening system. And then if those don't work, um, you know, you'll have hopefully a toolkit of a, a, a bunch of different um, ways that you can approach um, pests. And by pests, I, also, I mean um, insects as well as diseases and as well as um, weeds. So let's hop to it. Um, I think the main pests that we see in the springtime are um, aphids, slugs, weeds. Um, those are the ones that sort of show up um, as soon as it starts to warm up. And um, if we hadn't had this, this current frost um, sort of that we're having right now, I would have expected this to be a really, really heavy aphid year. So I'm hoping this is one of the benefits of the cold is that it takes out um, a bunch of the aphids that were probably getting ready to start hatching because because it hadn't been very cold this year. So I hope everyone has seen an aphid. I mean, this is an up close version. Um, one of the things that you should know is that um, aphids are sucking insects. They have a proboscis that um, enters into leaf tissue and sucks out the juices and amino acids and sugars. That's what they do. And when in that process, they often cause um, leaves to deform. Um, and sometimes they also spread diseases from, um, between plants. So they can be a vector for certain plant diseases. They really like tender new growth. Okay, and that's going to be really important to um, when we talk about management. So on your plants, the majority of the time aphids show up at the tips the new growth rather than like at the woody material near the bottom or in older leaves. They are born pregnant. Um, so they are grandmothers when they're already born. Um, they don't need any males to um, increase their numbers. They can start laying uh, viable eggs right away. And that's why often you will see you know, one or two aphids, and then you come by a week later and it's just like, oh my God, what has just happened? Their life cycle is extremely short. It's about 21 days. So that's why very quickly, a small number of aphids can suddenly create a colony. So another important point to note. Now they are soft bodied and, you know, knowing this makes control um, much, much easier. So Whatever pest you do come across, you know, try and see like, does it have a thick exoskeleton? Um, does it have that chitin exterior? Or is it soft bodied like aphids or mealybugs? Um, these types of, of pests are much easier to control than hard bodied ones. So 
we're going to talk about management techniques um, that don't require spraying or, or a chain or, you know, preparing something. And the first one is to look at your um, fertility regimen. If you are seeing aphids across a lot, a large number of different types of plants, like not just your tomatoes, not just your roses, it may be an indicator that you have a lot of nitrogen in your soil. And often, you know, gardeners love to um, see that lush growth that something like, um, you know, some of the, the fertilizers that are available in garden centers really have high nitrogen numbers and promote that very soft growth. Um, but it's very susceptible to aphid damage. So one of the techniques is, is to re-examine how much nitrogen you're putting down. And um, just a, a reminder that on your fertilizer package, um, nitrogen is the first number that you see in the series of three. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So that first number nitrogen, you really don't want to put more than 6%. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is uh, most organic fertilizers um, come in around 6%. Chicken manure and fish, fish fertilizer will come in up to 12. And that's a lot of nitrogen for especially young plants to absorb. It really, when you get above 6%, you really promote that lush growth that is very susceptible to aphids. So. Um, and I do know some gardeners who have put down, um, you know, a, um, a solid um, fertilizer in their pots, and then they do a weekly fish fertilizer, um, and then maybe something else on top. And it, it it's too much. So save yourself some money and save yourself some grief in terms of aphid um, control, just by reducing the amount of nitrogen that you put down. Technique number two. Okay, hand squishing. I know it sounds really gross, but you know, that technique of just, you know, going and rubbing with your hands um, between your fingers, because they're soft bodied, as I mentioned, they squish really easily. And hey, you know, if you just go out with your cup of tea or your cup of coffee in the morning and one handedly, you know, can go around and squish a whole bunch of the, the aphids that are just on the tips of certain plants, that can be like a really satisfying way to start the day, maybe for some of us. <laughs> um, and mind you, when I'm coming talking about all these techniques, obviously, if this is something you're not comfortable with, you can, you know, ignore it and, and look at some of the other techniques. I'm going to show a, a bunch. So save what you can in your toolkit and just ignore the ones that just are not appealing to you. Technique number three, dislodging them with a jet of water. So um, aphids are not attached to plants very well. Um, and if you spray them with a good strong jet of water, it often sends them flying into the grass or into something else where they have no food supply and they will often, you know, die um, wherever they land. So that's another way of really quickly um, getting rid of a lot of aphids. Now, um, the types of plants that can withstand like a strong jet of water, you know, apple trees, maybe your roses, but obviously, you know, very frilly, frondy things may not, this may not work. So, you know, you judge what, what uh, sort of the sturdiness of, of the plant. Um, often artichokes get really um, badly hit by, by aphids. So this is a really great technique for them because those leaves are quite robust and you can hit them quite, quite quickly. So yeah, use your garden hose to your advantage. Now, we're gonna start talking about um, preparations that you can make um, to do aphid control, but um, does anyone have any questions up until now? We've covered a fair amount, so I'll just pause and, and double check. I'm not hearing some, any, so we'll move on. So um, as you can see, we're gonna talk about using a garlic spray. So garlic has, I mean, apart from being amazingly delicious and fantastic to grow in this part of the world, um, garlic contains compounds called allicin, which are natural pest deterrents, especially for the aphid family. 
um, the aphids don't like the smell of it. So it, it prevents them from you know, actually coming in onto a plant, but then also helps with reducing their multiplication. Um, now, allicin is an oil-based compound. So you need to extract it out of the garlic in the presence of an oil or a fat. And so whatever oil that you have in your, um, in your pantry, um, I wouldn't use your expensive, you know, imported olive oil, use whatever um, cheaper oil, it doesn't have, you know, there's no, no need to have um, a specific type. You're just using it to extract the allicin. So the recipe, and, and this is something, if, if this type of technique interests you, is um, three to four cloves of garlic crushed in about a tablespoon of oil. So you can do that in your blender or in a mortar and pestle or however, whatever way works for you in a, in a food processor. You want to really mash that garlic well in the presence of oil to extract um, you know, those compounds that we're looking for. Once that is done, you want to sieve it, you know, take out all of the solid bits, capture the oil, and then put it into whatever spray bottle or application technique that you will be using. So, you know, it'll just be a tiny amount of oil. You then fill up the bottle with water, you know, probably no more than a liter, because this is like, it's a small amount of oil. You don't want to dilute it that much, but up to a liter of water. And then just before spraying, um, put in a few um, drops of dish soap. So dish soap acts as a sticker. It's going to find all those um, oily compounds and, and you know, form these molecules that allow um, that oil to stick to the plant once you actually spray it. So you know, without the sticker, the, the oil tends to just drip off with the water. So a soap, especially a liquid soap is, is helpful. And that's true with any kind of homemade um, remedy that you have that you're gonna try in, in your, um, to, to do pest control. So adding a few drops of dish soap is always really helpful. Um, <clears throat> this um, has, I find worked quite well with small numbers of aphids, especially when you catch them early before they really get to be a, a big problem. I don't know if anyone else has any other um, techniques. I've heard some gardeners use like chili powder in either mixed in with the garlic or have had success with chili on its own. Um, but this seems to be like the, the go-to that a lot of gardeners use and have found success with. Arsina, there's yeah. a question about um, plants that the aphids are most attracted to. Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, yeah, because it does tend to be fa um, family-like. And one thing I should also mention is that aphids don't just come in that green color that I mentioned or that you saw the photo of. They come in all different colors from green to like a reddish um, color, brownish to black. And Often aphids are very specific to the plant families that they like. So I find like in nasturtiums and broad beans, it tends to be the darker gray, like a slate color um, aphid that wants to attack that family. Um, more greener ones do tend to be on like the um, roses and, and apple trees. And as I mentioned before, um, Artichoke family gets hit by aphid, um, hostas. Anyone have any other plants? Beans can be hit by aphids if, again, if the nitrogen is high in, in the soil. Um, we don't normally put down a nitrogen fertilizer with beans, but if there's leftover fertility in the soil, that can sometimes happen. Um, hostas sometimes will get hit by, by aphids too. Any other plants that I'm not thinking of that Folks can. I had them come from a, a lemon tree. Yes. yes. Onto my tomatoes and um, peppers and stuff, and I was quite upset about this because I had been told that um, that they don't go from one plant, you know, species to another; that they're quite different. But um, so we've got other people chiming in with kale yep. and grapes. Question mark and um, broccoli, roses. Yes. 
Um, you know, the I find kale can get extremely hit by by aphids in the in midsummer. Um, often when plants are so we talked about overstimulation and over fertilization that can be um, make plants susceptible to aphids, but stress can also make them very susceptible. And for kale, the heat of like mid to late July is a time when I find kale is very susceptible. And often, I mean, to the extent like you don't even want to touch any of the leaves that are so kale covered, we will chop off like all of those infected leaves to try and just get rid of them. Um, so, or we just stop um, harvesting kale for a few weeks until the cool weather comes. Um, it's, you know, it's a issue of moisture availability for the kale as well. So when it's cooler and the soil is able to hold water for longer, that's, um, that's another way that, um, we can, that, that plants become more susceptible, but yeah, all of those tend to, to, um, have, have aphids as well. Okay. Um, Wendy's commenting that black currants have, can have quite can a have, problem as well. Yeah. Yeah, they can. And um, there's a request um, if you could talk about Drosophila flies that plague berries. D the Drosophila, okay. I Drosophila, can talk about yes, that. thank sure, you. Sure, sure, okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about one technique, um, one more thing um, for aphid control that you apply. And then we're gonna get a bit into some of the more natural um, methods. But this is the one where if, if none of the others are, are helpful to you or the aphid problem is just too large, or I find especially in indoor plants where you don't have the natural controls that are present outside, like with lemon trees, when you bring them in for the winter time, Using an insecticidal soap spray that is bought from the store can be really helpful. So these are um, just sprays where the fatty acids of soap have been extracted and put into a, a bottle um, and come under the name Safers, Green Earth or EcoSense. There's a bunch of different, depending on your local store, what they, what they stock. Um, these are all organically acceptable and I find really effective um, especially in those cases of indoor plants um, or where, you know, the garlic spray is just not cutting it. So you can turn to a soap spray like this and, and have really good results. The only thing um, you want to do is read the, the bottle really well, because sadly, um, this type of spray um, is not good for plants that have waxy leaves. Um, and the one that comes to mind is nasturtiums which sadly like nasturtiums can really get hit by aphids, but um, this soap spray reacts, I think, with the waxiness of the leaf and causes it to burn. So um, it's not recommended for, for those types of plants. So um, if you have access, you know, something you might want to have in, in your toolkit or in your pantry, just in case something like this happens. And the bottle seems to last a fairly long time. It's not something that has to be used up quickly. Now, I want to go back to the whole idea of preventing those pests from happening in the first place. And one of the ways that you can do it is by sitting back and like letting nature take its course. And often nature um, provides time for the pest to actually flourish so that there's enough for the predators to come in and eat them. So one of the ones that, you know, is probably the most popular that we recognize is ladybugs. And ladybugs are really um, good for, for aphid control. To bring ladybugs into your garden, you want to plant a lot of plants in the umbilifer family, which has these umbrella shaped flowers. So for example, fennel or dill, um, cilantro is, is a great one. I know in the springtime, cilantro always goes to flower. 